Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. It's an honor to have you here. Let, let, let's start with double impact. Uh, tell us what it is. She just did. Well, yeah, <laughs> give us a little color. <laughs> so this is uh, the first new business at Bain Capital in a dozen years. It's a $390 million private equity fund. To me, that's a lot of money. It's grown $40 million since you I know, I know. It's a, it's a, to me, that's a lot of money. At Bain Capital, it's quaint. Yeah. That's a charming little fund. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a fund we launched uh, in the impact investing uh, space to invest in uh, later stage, lower middle market, North American companies for both um, uh, financial return. We're underwriting to the same standards as the large cap fund of Bain Capital. And measurable um, uh, impact in three sort of thematic verticals. And they are sustainability, health, and wellness, and what we're describing as community building. And I can get more. Uh, into yeah, that. Well, we'll go into those in a minute. But you said you were underwriting to the same standards mm -hmm. as the large cap funds. Yep. Come on. I mean, you really are expected to get the same return as the other investments? So more to the point, the LPs are expecting us to. And you know, that's, that's a, we've, we've, chosen, uh, we've chosen the sectors to invest in with this in mind. Uh, you know, impact investing, as I'm sure your, uh, um, your guests will know, exists on a, on a, on a spectrum. Uh, some folks are, uh, are doing this with the perspective of you know, just getting uh, principal back, some not even that. Uh, others, a uh, concessionary rate of return at, at Bain Capital, you know, some of my colleagues say, we don't know how to spell concessionary. Um, you know, we chose uh, a market rate of return, not as a value investment, but, uh, but because number one, that's the return that investors of ba in Bain Capital products expect, um, but also because I think it's important to demonstrate at scale that you don't have to cheat uh, a trade return for, uh, uh, for impact. So we, there were some things we were interested in that we chose not to invest in because we couldn't generate a private equity style return. So for example, uh, affordable housing, enormously important, but we couldn't see a yeah. private equity style uh, return. But I, I, I want to go into detail into some of the specific investments, but before we do that, just go back to this one time. I mean, if your investments are truly able to get the same return that the other funds get, yep. why do you need double impact? Well, um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, entrepreneurs we've met um, who are mission oriented, um, because they're fast growing, you're right, they could give capital in. They can attract capital. But sometimes what they tell us, uh, uh, what they have told us in that year of homework we did before we launched, was that they could attract capital that made them feel that when they sold out, they sold on. Or rather, they sold on, they sold out, which is to say, they, uh, they couldn't find a capital partner who was interested in helping them scale the whole of their enterprise. Um, so for example, we had a uh, marvelous uh, uh, entrepreneur who founded a company called Sundial Brands, um, Shea Moisture. Anybody know that um, shampoo, um, sustainable bath and body product? Great, great story. Um, and they were growing like a week, 30%, uh, 30, 40% a year. Um, very intentional about the whole supply chain. They sourced from women's cooperatives in West Africa and they cut out the middleman because they wanted to be intentional about lifting the living standards of the women at the end of the supply chain. Very intentional about all the stages of the, of the supply chain. And um, they could attract capital, but um, they hadn't found anybody who was interested in maintaining or sustaining that mission. And that mission was a part of their brand identity. So they came to us because um, they had read that I was joining the firm to start this new fund. And in fact, we hadn't even launched the fund. Um, but uh, um, the folks in the large cap um, uh, business were interested in this story. And in fact, the size of the check was such that it was more appropriate, frankly, for them. I was on the deal team. Uh, we did the deal. And we sold the company to Unilever in, uh, in uh, December for four times what we, what we paid. So then, you, sticking with the sun, sundial, mm -hmm. sundial <laughs> example, I mean, what defines success of double impact? Do you hope to ultimately show the large cap fund that they should be paying attention to the other things as well as, it, it, I mean, 390 million is a lot of money for most of us, but it's, as you said, it's not really that much money. Yeah. What, what, what's success here? So first of all, um, the, the thesis that there is 
premium value to a mission-oriented brand is something that our colleagues in the, in the retail um, vertical in our large cap fund already get. So they're already investing behind that for secular trend. Mm -hmm. I think what we're trying to show in the middle market is this point I made earlier that you don't have to trade return for, for impact. Um, and I, I think that, by the way, as we do, um, it raises some really important questions for investing generally, to your point. And that's not just within our firm, I think, uh, I think, uh, I think generally. And, and I, I guess I'd make the, larger, um, make the larger point. I'm not sure that um, uh, this is on the minds of all of my colleagues. This is more a personal point. Um, Short-termism, I think, is a poison. You know, when I was in my business career, this, this notion of quarter to quarter management, I think, has been a real problem. Uh, sometimes I think at the, uh, uh, in, in placing in jeopardy the long, -time, long term interests of the enterprise. And I think that same bad habit has crept into the way we govern. We govern from election cycle to election cycle, sometimes new cycle to new cycle, and not generation to generation. And I think that um, getting back to a sense of long-term value, whether it's um, in business or in, uh, in the way we govern, is also at the root of impact investing. It's how we think about all of the consequences of our investment. Well, well, sticking with business for a minute, we'll get to government, but sticking with business for a minute, do you think capitalism is in crisis? I mean, you're a Democrat. Yeah. Your party came this close to nominating somebody who described himself as a socialist. Mm. Uh, you, the, the most talked about candidate for the next election is a woman who sounds a lot like him. Um, Who's that? <laughs> we'll get to that too. Uh, 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 I see our time is up. <laughs> <laughs> but do you do you do you think we face a crisis of capitalism? Well, I think I you know you talk to a lot of um, I talk to a lot of um, young people coming out of the recession, and I think their um, their confidence in capitalism is shaken. And I say this as a capitalist. You know, I'm not a market fundamentalist. I don't believe markets solve every problem just in time. But I do believe in, uh, in capitalism. And I think capitalism is an important feature of democracy. Um, but I think that, um, that the uh, that capitalist orthodoxy um, has been questioned and fairly questioned since the recession. And by an awful lot of uh, young people whose uh, expectations about capitalism were deeply shaken, frankly, by a whole lot of us, uh, whose expectation of capitalism were deeply <coughs> shaken by the, uh, by the recession, where um, a lot of those um, bad habits drove us right into a ditch. So I think there are ways in which um, responsible capitalists are thinking more broadly about this question of long-term value and how you make um, capitalist decisions, market-oriented decisions that take into account all of these um, uh, consequences. I, I think that's what accounts for the full room you have in front of you right now. Well, this, this is my point. Right? And, 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 and there are many rooms like this, by the way. And, 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 I, and, you, and you hear it more and more from leaders of large companies. And uh, is that ultimately what you're trying to do at Double Impact? Is well, I, to, I think. It, it show capitalism can work to everyone's I think we are a part of this movement, if you will. We are a part of this broader conversation. It's a very good thing, very encouraging um, uh, uh, thing. And it's a conversation, I think, that is, that is uh, blooming in lots of, different, uh, 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 lots of different ways. I am uh, you know, I'm quite confident that we are going to be uh, wildly successful. Um, we, we closed our sixth deal, number six deal, on Monday, just day before yesterday. And we have two two more in the short end. But the trick is um, not the buying. The no, trick I, get is the I get it. 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 Actually, the trick is deploying right now because everything's so expensive. Yeah. So, um, do you want to you want to mention one or two of them? Tell us about one or two. Sure. Get a sense of what you're doing. Sure. So we we did a deal um, called Living Earth. So I, I just a, a little preamble. Yeah. Um, the deals sort of fall broadly into what I would describe as. Um, those that are companies that are inherently impactful, where the, where the business model um, is, uh, 
by nature impactful, and those where we are trying to manage them toward a more impactful mm -hmm. model. So one uh, I would describe as inherently impactful is a company called Living Earth mm -hmm. that uh, diverts organic material from uh, organic waste from landfills where it would otherwise break down and turn into um, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, recycles it and sells it out as uh, uh, composted soil and mulch. Uh, and um, uh, we bought this company, it's, it's the largest of its kind in Texas. We're trying to scale it, we are scaling it in Texas and, uh, and across the Southeast. You know, the bigger it gets, the more impact. Um, we've, we moved into, uh, into Tennessee and, uh, and, uh, and moving across the Southeast, as I, as I uh, mentioned. Um, it's ridiculously profitable. Um, you know, you get paid coming in and going out. It's terrific money. Um, we bought a company uh, in, uh, uh, in um, Michigan and northern Indiana, a series of low-cost gyms called mm -hmm. Impact Fitness. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the, that the uh, you probably knew this, the sort of conventional economics of gyms is charge as much as possible and hope nobody comes. <laughs> and this is, this is the inverse, it's, it's charged 10 bucks a month and, and drive really you. Yeah. Right. And the, the, this, is, this is a model that targets um, so-called fitness deserts, so places where there are high degrees of um, uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes, driving utilization, starting to measure numbers of times a week people get their heart rates up, sharing that with their uh, 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 health care providers to drive down um, uh, insurance premiums and so forth. So how do you, as somebody who has worked in government, worked in nonprofits, and, and worked in the private sector, how do you think about the role of each of those in addressing these kinds of social problems? So we talked about this a little bit um, uh, before uh, coming, on, coming on today. And um, I think about this a lot. I, I will say, I think the sectors are, you know, sort of jealously defend their respective prerogatives um, when there is so much more power in the collaboration among and between uh, the sectors. Uh, um, Lauren will remember the, um, anybody here from Massachusetts? Some of you here from Massachusetts? You guys quite yeah. um, And did you vote for No, 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 no. no. <laughs> sure. Everybody's, we're all one today. Um, <laughs> We, um, we had a, uh, so at 15 minutes after I took office, the bottom fell out of the global economy. And um, we, had, uh, we had to think hard about what the strategy was to try to climb out of that hole. And one of the strategies was, uh, one of the job creation uh, strategies was uh, something we called the Life Sciences Initiative. And um, we looked around at all of these natural resources um, uh, we had, and one clear one was the brain power, right? There were 300 colleges, universities, research institutions, tri uh, teaching hospitals within 45 minutes of downtown Boston. It's a ridiculous concentration of brain power. But mostly they don't talk to you or hadn't talked to each other. We had um, a biotech industry, but it was, it was kind of loose and, and independent and, and Boston like, kind of, you know, this is ours. And, um, and we don't, uh, we don't talk to each other. And so we, we got um, uh, some of the industry participants, some of the university folks, hospitals, uh, academics together, and we talked about this and how we would, uh, what were the gaps? How could we start to promote this thing? How could we start to collaborate? What were others doing? California had announced a four or five billion dollar uh, initiative. What was happening outside the, uh, the country? And how could we knit this thing um, together and take it to a whole other uh, le level? Today, um, Massachusetts is the undisputed global destination for the biotech industry. And it was one of the industries that, that pulled us out of the session ahead of most of the rest of the nation. That was a collaboration. Mm -hmm. Government didn't do that by itself. Mm -hmm. It was a 10-year initiative. It was a billion dollars of government money plugging little holes that industry told us strategically made sense. You know, little, little bits of money, valley of death kind of thing for, um, for, for worthy uh, uh, companies or, or infrastructure um, uh, needs for particular uh, companies, but a lot of 
you know, promotion. So that kind of thing where we're, we're doing stuff together, that's high that's impact stuff. It happens in education uh, as well. I ask that because I think part of what drives a lot of uh, the companies that are here in the room today to, to move further in this direction is the sense that government, at least at the federal level, isn't doing very well at addressing <coughs> infrastructure, at addressing health care, at addressing uh, the training challenge, at addressing the environment, any, any number of these issues. Uh, and what I hear from a lot of business leaders is they, they, it's, it's not just that shared value makes for a better company, but they feel like they have to step up because somebody's got to do it. And uh, Well, Michael Porter wrote a, an interesting piece in, in Fortune last year uh, with Catherine Gell where he said, our biggest economic problem is our political problem. The system isn't working. Mm. Um, how do you feel about that? <laughs> Well, we definitely don't have enough time for how I feel about that. I mean, he, he's, he's right that the, that the moment presents uh, a particular vacuum for, uh, for business to step up. But the moment, you know, th there will be a time when government starts to function better. You, and I, you sure about that? I, you know what, I'm, I'm hopeful about that. Um, and, and I hope that, that when that time comes, gov that, that that better means a more collaborative government. But I, I hope it does not mean a return to a, a point that I, a place I used to feel where, um, where government or philanthropy lets business off the hook. In other words, I hope, it, it, I hope that business continues to step up and that uh, government functioning again uh, means government collaborating. I think the greatest power I felt I had in my old job was the convening path, right? Most people would come to the table, including people who don't talk to each other outside of the government's office. I'm, I'm, we got a lot of questions coming in. I want to uh, take those questions, but let me just take this one point further because I spent most of my career in Washington, have watched this for a number of decades, feel very strongly that you know, every year I think it can't get worse and every year it does get worse. And, and we're seeing the parties go further and further apart. This was Michael Porter's point. He said it's actually, from a competitive analysis, what is developing is a duopoly. It works for the parties. They get to raise a lot of money, drive a lot of excitement. It doesn't work for the customer, the citizen. But, but I don't see anything changing the direction, the bifurcation, the, the increasing polarization of the public. What's going to make it change? Well, um, uh, Michael, and I think in that article had some has some, uh, uh, help diagnose the problem. I, I think I'm right in remembering the article. I mean, some of it is money. Yeah. Um, some of it is, uh, uh, is, the, uh, is the gerrymandering. Yep. Some of it is the voter suppression. Um, and we, you know, we, we did this to ourselves. We did this to ourselves. You know, in, in a democracy, you get the government you deserve. Make no mistake about it, right? We made this. We made this. And so the sooner we stop talking about how it act, it happened to us somehow, and, uh, and start taking some responsibility for it, the better we will be. Um, so we have it within our, uh, within our power. Yeah. We have it within our power to create a democracy agenda, right? And it, I think it ought to address um, uh, transparency and indeed limits. On, uh, on money in, in, uh, uh, in government. And it's not that you know, people ought not have a voice, but it, it's a thing that keeps a lot of really good people from getting in. It's just daunting. Um, we ought to have um, a, a more balanced approach. I'm not talking about keeping politics out of politics, but um, we ought to have a more balanced uh, approach to how we draw the lines for, for representation. What's, what's the line today that now representatives choose their voters, not the voters <laughs> choosing their representatives? Um, and we ought to have, uh, we ought to deal with the fact that, uh, that um, many, many jurisdictions are making it harder, rather intentionally harder, rather than easier for voters uh, to cast a uh, uh, to vote, uh, cast their vote, and that is wrong. Um, and when we start to do that, it'll open up, and it should open up, and it will be more, uh, it will be more competitive. Let's, uh, thank you for that. Let's take some of these questions. Uh, 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 first one is what types of investors are interested in double impact? Where are you getting your LP? Yeah, so it's a, it's a, uh, they're all anonymous. <laughs> I say anonymous. 
I would love to be able to look at whoever's asking that question, but I guess you don't want to be called out. Um, so it's a, it's a sort of typical range of types of investors, meaning um, uh, public and private pensions, high net worth individuals, um, you know, those sorts. I will say it was funny. The, the, when the conversation first started about uh, my coming in uh, to, uh, uh, to do this, uh, it was because there were investors in other bank capital funds who had expressed interest in this, um, mostly from New York, by the way, where the impact investing is, is, a, is more mature, uh, at least it was uh, then. And so when we, we, after this year of homework and study and, uh, and talking to everybody, we went to those investors uh, to say, we're ready with our business plan. How about, I mean, you want to come in? And they said, this is perfect. Um, here's $100 million. And we said, well, hold on, that's, that's too much. And they said, uh, you know, it's, it's $100 million or zero. We, you know, these are huge institutions. Um, and we said, well, you know, we're starting small. And they said, well, you know, we, we don't do small. So we had to go introduce ourselves to a whole other group of investors who were, um, who were willing to do smaller size checks. Family office type investors. Family investment. offices and so forth. Uh, that may be one of the problems in this sector, right, is that there are people willing to deploy capital, but they're deploying it at such a scale that it's hard to do the kinds of well, things and they want to do. Yes, that is right. And also, you know, first funds and all that um, uh, sort of thing. And, I, you know, there are 15 of us on this team, 14 who are full-time on the team, 14 of whom are experienced private equity investors. Um, and, uh, and folks wanted to see the team all together and all that. So I, I, in a way, we, we, we sort of saw, our, we can see ourselves to a second fund that is huge, um, but we had to introduce ourselves to, uh, to a first but fund. But it's interesting, when I, talk, when I talk to CEOs who are moving their companies in this shared value direction, I always ask them why. And the answer I get most often, well, many of them will say it's a personal passion. But then the next answer is, my employees. Mm -hmm. I have to do this because my employees want me to do it and we're in a battle for talent and if I don't do it I'm not going to be able to get the piece, best people. And more recently occasionally you hear customers. Yes. They almost always say that the investors are the last, the slowest uh, to jump on the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's changing? Well, you know, an investment fund is, is different than an operating um, company I think in that Respect. I mean, look, I, we are a source of pride within the firm. We are inundated with, re with resumes. We, we are a little bit of a, of a problem, I would say, um, within the firm in the sense that folks want to transfer. Good people want to move to you. Yeah, they yeah. want to they transfer. So that's a little disruptive. <laughs> It doesn't bother me, but it bothers uh, it yeah. my, <laughs> I can my colleagues. Um, no, but it's good. It's it's good, and you know, and we don't. We also we collaborate. So things come into us. The check size is too big. We bring them to other um, divisions in the uh, firm. We work on stuff together and, and co-invest. Um, so. Uh, so how do you think about diversity, equity, and inclusion when you're making investments? Is that a core value? Uh, well, so in, I I will say that. Um, um, maybe, maybe not in the way the question is, yes is the answer, but maybe not in the way the question is asked. So we do not have a, uh, uh, as a thematic vertical, um, the, um, uh, the um, uh, race or ethnicity or the gender of the entrepreneur as a factor. There are funds that, um, that do, but we haven't. Um, in the community building vertical, which is more of a place-based, Yep. strategy where we're investing or in search of um, uh, companies who are creating jobs um, and catalyzing uh, economic activity in places of chronic um, underemployment. The entrepreneurs have tended to be, have overweighted um, uh, racial and ethnic uh, minorities or women. Hmm. And um, we, haven't, uh, we haven't invested uh, yet behind those um, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, we have some that are further along in the diligence than, uh, uh, than others, but we don't, have a, yep. we don't have a result yet. So this next question, we kind of danced around a little while ago, but, uh, but we'll, let's see if we can take it on more directly. Uh, double impact investing is one arm of Bain. Why isn't it the whole portfolio? Why isn't this what the whole, all, all the Bain investors are doing? Well, I, so 
meaning, um, why isn't the whole the concept of shared value that, yeah. it, that it, it should not only be a financial return but have some demonstrable value to society? I think that's a fair question. Actually, first of all, we have to do um, um, we have to do uh, CSR reporting fund wide. Um, all of the um, uh, all of the LPs are required net of all of the funds. That's a that's a new requirement, by the way, in the last eighteen months, I would say. Mm. Um, and the largest investors, again, starting in Europe, starting outside the United States, have required that of all of the uh, funds, starting with the uh, with the large cap um, uh, fund. We have to report, report that, as I say, firm um, firm wide. I think that um, in time. Um, the notion of, uh, of full consequence investing, which is one, the way one of our LPs describes what they do, yep. um, will be the norm. I think we're going to have to prove it at scale. Yep. Um, uh, and as I said, that's part of, that's part of that's our That's part of what you're doing. Um, yeah. But I, I, I think we're going to have to, uh, we're going to sh we're gonna have to have proof points. Yeah. Uh, that there isn't a uh, that there isn't a trade, and as I say, at least in the retail group, uh, already they are investing behind this uh, thesis that because of secular trends, consumers are um, are are you know making choices to associate around mission-oriented um, brands right now. Yeah. That there's a premium in the market for such uh, uh, brands. They are already in this same yeah. mind space. Um, uh, they already use the same language. Um, uh, you can uh, maybe we, pull them a little further. We're already drafting yeah. behind them. We'll see or, this, I think. In a, uh, or pulling them in your draft. Exactly. Uh, um, uh, endless impact opportunities in emerging markets. Why a U.S. focus? Uh, th these people want you to do a lot. No, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I, well, so the, the, um, we started, uh, as I say, like the, the amount of money seems like a lot to me, but um, we started small because we wanted to nail the model before we scaled. We started in North America because the team is new. We are active investors. We're not, you know, here's the check and we'll see you at board meetings. We want to be very involved and we want it, because we're new, we want to be together and become a team before we fan out. And we're all in Boston. We're all in Boston and New York. Um, so we want to be relatively close to our investments. So we thought, we'll start in North America. It's pretty easy to get around. Um, among the questions for Fund 2 is what the geographic footprint should be. Mm -hmm. And so, and we, the, the firm has offices in many parts of the uh, uh, world. So it's, it's conceivable that we may expand our um, geographic footprint. There's a lot to like about and a lot to do in emerging markets. Um, uh, I'm particularly tempted around Latin America and, uh, and Africa. But before we go big, we want to make sure that this team feels like a team and is working like a, like a team. And that, you know, that felt like yeah. we needed to really be in one place and close. Yeah. Um, a good question here about the economy. We're at, we're at kind of a peak. Uh, it's been, you know, it's now the second longest expansion on record. Unemployment is down below 4%. Uh, uh, so, it's a strong moment. What happens? Uh, what happens when the inevitable bust sets in? How is that going to affect impact investing? How is it going I to don't affect know. Doubling? I don't know. I, 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 That's all right. But no I, one else I, does either. But yeah, they still say nobody, something. Everybody asks those questions. Nobody knows. But you tell me. Who asked that question? <laughs> Anonymous. I mean, it's, I, 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 I understand. I understand um, the curiosity around that. Um, around that question, I wish I had some wisdom about it. I, I guess I would say that in a lot of the places that we are <coughs> investing, it doesn't necessarily feel like it's doom time. Mm -hmm. um, we are really, really interested in some of the, um, I hate to use this term, um, but we're, we're investing in sort of second and third cities, you know, places where it doesn't, you know, it just doesn't feel like New York or the Bay Area or Boston or, or, or what have you, but where there are really great things happening and um, really terrific uh, companies and, frankly, where we can see an exit 
after a, a reasonable uh, uh, hold period. I think if you think about um, the question before about emerging markets, do they see a boom time? Um, um, so I, I, I get it. I mean, I, I suppose in some ways you'd want to be investing, you want to be buying, you want to be sort of economically cold about it, you want to be buying then. We have uh, uh, capital and, uh, and holding and building then, and then ready to sell when prices start to go yep. up, uh, uh, start to go up again. But I, you know, the economy's boom and bust. I ain't worried about that. Should business be acting to support the democracy agenda? And if so, is there a shared value, value approach? I'm not sure I completely understand that question, but we talked about the crisis in capitalism. Yeah. There's also a crisis in democracy. Yeah. And what's the role of business in addressing that? So if the question is about what I described as the democracy uh, agenda, I, I guess I, I, I would love to have business uh, uh, support. I mean, I just outlined what I think in very loose terms, what I think the democracy agenda right. ought to uh, uh, ought to be, I I think everybody ought to support it. I, I don't. I mean, I, this is a serious problem. Democracy is up for grabs. And and we can decide. I, there's a friend of mine who's, who who says we've been treating our democracy for a long time as if it would tolerate limitless abuse without breaking. And it turns out we can break it. <laughs> um, and I think, it's, it, I think it's all hands on deck. So what, so can, I, what, what can, it's a really interesting question because you know, uh, when I was growing up, people thought of the Republican Party as the party of business and the mm. Democratic Party more as the party of labor. Um, we've, we've gone to a completely different place. I would argue uh, that the last election was the first election where neither candidate was really carrying the agenda of, of, of business. And now with this polarization that we're talking about, you often find that business leaders are the most pragmatic, one might even say the most progressive on issues like human rights. Mm -hmm. on, uh, you know, Look at what happened in North Carolina mm -hmm. when uh, uh, Bank of America and all the other companies stepped in and said, you can't do this, limit access by transgenders to public bathrooms. Yeah. Uh, look at uh, uh, what happened with uh, what's happening with uh, companies like Delta and, and the NRA. Mm -hmm. uh, the business now sort of finds itself in the middle of this increasing polarization. Mm -hmm. What's the appropriate role for them to play in healing the breach? You know, um, I was talking with my friend Ken Frazier from Merck. It's a great uh, example. Yeah. About uh, uh, his experience after Charlottesville on the. Uh, and his, uh, well, just talk about what he did. I think most people probably know, but so Ken Fraser is the CEO of Merck, and uh, he was, I think, did he chair the President's Manufacturing Council? No, no, he was on, on the it. President's uh, Manufacturing Council, and after Charlottesville and the President's comments about Charlottesville, he resigned, and um, and he explained his decision uh, to resign uh, as being in protest of the president's um, equating the grievances of uh, the white supremacists with the, uh, with the protests of the, uh, of the, um, with the well, with the, with the counter protests, yeah. I guess, of them. And, uh, and that led to the dismantling of the, uh, of the uh, Manufacturing Council. And I was talking to him about what the conversation was behind the scenes with his board. Yeah. Um, and he said, and I've known Ken since we were both GCs. He was GC at Merck, and I was GC at Coca-Cola. And um, he said, you know, that conversation, his public comments um, weren't kind of out of the blue. This is, you know, he had a relationship with his board a long time, and obviously he talked with his board before he made his public uh, uh, public comments. They knew him; he knew them, uh, and. Uh, and the way I put it is, and we were doing this sort of thing at an HBS reunion event a few mm -hmm. weeks ago and talking about this. And the way I put the question is, you know, how did, how did you come to a place where you were comfortable bringing your whole self to your role as CEO? Yeah. And, uh, and that's, and so he began to talk about that. And he said, you know, I've been at this job a long time. I've been CEO for, you know, a dozen years. 
I had been uh, general counsel for um, uh, I don't know, 10 years before, um, before that. They knew me. They knew me as more than the hired help. Um, I delivered, right? I've been good at my job. Um, uh, and they understood I had a, uh, they understood my backstory. Um, and he said, I, and he also said, we are at a point where more and more business leadership is having to step up Bingo. Yeah. And, uh, and fill a void um, in the civic space, not the political, in the civic space. By the way, that's a very old-fashioned idea, isn't it? Right? I, it it's a very old-fashioned idea in a way. And you, you can find companies like S.C. Johnson that have kind of always operated like exactly. this, but it's a big, as somebody who's covered business for the last four decades, yeah. it's a very big change. I mean, you look at what Ken Frazier did in that occasion. You look at what Ed Bastian at Delta did in cutting off uh, NRA discounts. I mean, come on, he runs an airline. Right. What, why, why is he getting himself? Yeah. Uh, you, you look at what Brian Moynihan at Bank of America yeah. did on the uh, uh, transgender access. Uh, those are and things public companies versus S.C. Johnson. Those are big right. public companies. Yeah. I can tell you 10 years ago, the response of those CEOs would, would have been, transgender bathrooms? Are you kidding me? I'm a banker. I'm going to keep my head down and not talk to anybody about this. So something very different is going on. And, I, and so on the, on the question that was asked about the, about the democracy agenda, I would say... I would say even different from the, the um, sort of social issues where I think that leadership has been inspired, but I can understand that it's, it's controversial. The question around the, uh, around the democracy agenda, to me, is about citizenship. And that seems to me everybody has a stake in. Um, that, to me, is not a partisan um, question. That's a, that's a citizenship question. I think, as I say, everybody's yeah. got a stake in. So we only have a, a minute left, and somebody has asked the question in a veiled way, but I'm going to ask it in an explicit way. Uh, there's some very important people out there who think you should run for president. In <laughs> and are urging you to, you got a, you got, looks like you got some votes right here. So, so how are you? Okay, now I really see our time is up. No? <laughs> you, got, you got 49 seconds here. How, how are you thinking about that? That clock is wrong. <laughs> I am, um, thank you for that. Um, That's why I'm here. Yeah. So I, I have a job, um, and I'm, I'm enjoying it enormously. I am, uh, now that the you know, fund is raised and the team is in place and we're, and we're doing good deals, um, I'm going to try to have, you know, within bounds, um, some public voice. I'm going to try to get involved um, in the uh, in the midterm, um, where I, you know, where where I'm invited, and where I can um, where I can be helpful with um, with candidates who have, you know, more of this sense of uh, sort of service leadership or servant leadership, not the hyper partisan, but. Uh, I mean, I'm a Democrat. I'm, I'm, I'm proud. I'm not the sort of Democrat who thinks you have to hate Republicans to be a good Democrat. Um, but I, I do think it's such a, it's such a worrisome time. And I, I think, as I said, I, I do think that democracy is in jeopardy. And I think we need um, a different kind of uh, courage in our leadership than we see. Uh, and I think there's some marvelous new leaders stepping up. And I, if they, and some of them have asked for help, and if I can help, I want to help. So you're thinking about it. I'm thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> but you're thinking about, could you roll the, Justin, roll the clock back a few minutes? I'm, I'm not quite done. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>